Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 964 for August 7th, 2022. Coming up in a few minutes. I don't think we can explore enough peated whiskey. I'm sorry. You know, and if you're going to have a peated whiskey, you're going to have an Isla whiskey. And I think that having uh, one more, I mean, it'll only be 12. It's not as if it's going to be 112. I mean, we're not in space age. Yeah. Isla is getting yet another distillery, but this one is different in that it's being built by Isla Boys, literally. That's the name of Donald McKenzie and Mackay Smith's company. They grew up on the island, started an independent bottling business under the Isla Boys brand name, then bought the Isla Ales Brewery a couple of years later. Now they're going to build an expanded brewery and a distillery on a plot of land across from Isla's airport. It'll be the island's 12th distillery. I'll talk with Donald McKenzie later on Whiskey Cast in depth. We'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice behind the label, and... We've got about three feet of water in the top part of the distillery, and we <coughs> we have a basement, so... It was horrible in that basement. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. People never forget the person who introduced them to Redbreast. And then those people go on to introduce others to Redbreast. And soon the flock has grown exponentially. It's like a pyramid scheme. Without any of the bad stuff, of course. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Gabriel Cartarella here with Dewar's Whiskey, inviting you to enjoy this episode of Whiskey Cast with a glass of Dewar's, the most awarded blended Scotch whiskey in history. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. Eastern Kentucky is still reeling from the impact of the recent flash floods that left at least 37 people dead and countless people affected. It may be months before water service is restored in some areas, and hundreds of people are homeless. The Bourbon community is coming together once again to help. The Bourbon Crusaders are teaming up with the Kentucky Distillers Association, Westport Whiskey and Wine in Louisville, and our friend Fred Minnick to organize a charity auction. Brian Hara of the Bourbon Crusaders says it'll be a lot like last December's auction, following the tornadoes that leveled parts of western Kentucky. We are in a really quick time frame here. Uh, We're getting bottles together as quickly as we can. We're getting uh, barrel selections and experiences from member distilleries together as quickly as we can through the leadership of of Eric Gregory at KDA. Fred Minnick's involved again, and he's soliciting donations And this time, I think we're going to do only a silent auction. It'll start on August 11th and run for 10 days. And we'll have new lots being released uh, on uh, on some regular basis. Uh, And we're looking to have an idea of what sort of items we'll have by the end of this week or early next week even. So you're still looking for donations of items, right? We're, we're still looking for donations of items and welcome anyone who, who, who the spirit moves them to, to give a donation here because the, the folks in Eastern Kentucky really need our help. I've, my heart's been warmed that a lot of people are helping in, in the ways that they can. There's a lot of local food trucks that are driving to Eastern Kentucky, for example, and bourbon is the way we know how to help. So if anyone can, make a donation, we'll, we'll gladly take it, and it'll be in the auction beginning August 11th, and we'll put all of those funds directly to the Governor's Relief Fund, no administrative overhead or anything like that. And this is what the Bourbon Crusaders was founded to do, right? That's exactly right. We started our auctions in 2016 to honor Jim Rutledge uh, right after the time he had retired from Four Roses. Uh, and we, since then, we've partnered with distillers and distilleries and had them choose the charitable organization that they want to benefit. Uh, then, of course, we had to take a break during COVID from our live auctions. 
Uh, but we got together with the KDA and Fred Minnick for the December tornado release and were able to take off right from where we left off at our last auction and really expand it beyond our wildest dreams. So we're hoping to replicate uh, our, our success there in helping out the people of Kentucky who's been affected by these natural disasters. Last December's auction raised $3.4 million with one-of-a-kind bottles, barrels of whiskey, and unique experiences. We've included a link for more details in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. We do know of one distillery that has been affected by the flooding. The Kentucky Mist Distillery in Whitesburg suffered extensive damage when the North Fork of the Kentucky River flooded last week. Owner Colin Fultz told me they're still trying to clear three feet of mud out of the building. We've got about three feet of water in the top part of the distillery, and we <clears throat> we have a basement, so it was horrible in that basement. But uh, the biggest thing that we lost was like our labels and you know all of our stuff that we had purchased. That was the biggest biggest thing that we lost a bunch of bottles, labels. Just anything that was in the distillery, you know, it, 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 it turned the refrigerator over and uh, just uh, the cooler, we lost all, like we make all of our stuff with real fruit. So we, all the fruit and stuff that we had in the coolers gone, just all kinds of stuff. It's just it's devastating. We're trying to get it cleaned up. We're, we're getting close now. It's been been over a week so we're doing better maybe we'll be back able to produce here within a a week or so while residents of the area are being encouraged to apply for aid through fema fultz says he's been told that the only aid the distillery is eligible for is a disaster loan through the small business administration in other news diageo has completed another phase of its 185 million pound investment in its scottish distillery visitors centers Talisker's new visitor center opened to the public Friday with two new tours, with plans to add a cask tasting experience in the coming months. It's the sixth of Diageo's 14 visitor centers in Scotland to be upgraded and follows the opening of the Singleton brand home at Glenord Distillery last month. Kalila's new visitor center is on track to open in the coming weeks. While Mortlock doesn't have a visitor's center of its own, it does have a new whiskey out. The Midnight Malt is a new 30-year-old release. It's expected to have a retail price tag in the $4,500 range. Rosebank Distillery's reconstruction is on track. Ian McLeod Distillers plans to release its next vintage Rosebank single malt this week. It's a 31-year-old whiskey distilled shortly before the distillery closed in 1993. It'll be available starting this Thursday through the Rosebank website and at whiskey shops in the UK. There's no word yet on pricing. Finally, Belfast's latest distillery is finally back on track. Plans were first floated back in 2012 to build a distillery on the site of the old Crumlin Road Jail, but a series of setbacks delayed the project for an entire decade. Now, the owners of the Belfast Distillery Company have finally started construction on the distillery. It'll become the home of the J&J McConnell's whiskey brand when it opens. The Spirits Business reports the $27 million project will create around 50 new jobs. It's being built with funding support from the Northern Ireland government and the European Regional Development Fund. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com and on our social media timelines. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. Edinburgh's annual Whiskey Fringe returns this year after missing two years because of the pandemic. It gets underway on Friday and runs through next Sunday. 
The Los Angeles Magazine Whiskey Festival Series kicks off August 19th in downtown L.A. McTeers has its next whiskey auction that same day in Glasgow, Scotland. The Bourbon Women's Annual Symposium Conference is August 25th through the 28th in Louisville, Kentucky. Just Whiskey is on the 26th and 27th in Hamburg, Germany. Whiskey Live Adelaide is September 2nd and 3rd in Australia. And the Spirit of Speyside Distilled Food and Drink Festival is also on the 2nd and 3rd. That one's in Elgin, Scotland. The Black Bourbon Society's annual Bourbon Bull is September 2nd through the 4th in Louisville. And the Sydney Whiskey Fair is September 9th and 10th in Sydney, Australia. Our searchable calendar at WhiskeyCast.com lets you look for events in your area or wherever you may be traveling. It's brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states and three continents, as well as online. Visit the new BuyVirginiaRye.com site for more details, and please drink responsibly. Dewar's master blender Stephanie McLeod's innate curiosity, combined with her passion for whiskey maturation, cask finishing, and blending, has created some truly incredible expressions for Dewar's Scotch whiskey. It's also earned her four consecutive Master Blender of the Year titles at the International Whiskey Competition, making her the first person to achieve such an accolade. Her innovative spirit is the inspiration behind the ultra-premium Dewar's Double Double 32 Year, the highest-rated blended Scotch whiskey in the world with a score of 94.4. So whether you consider yourself a whiskey connoisseur or just want to find an exciting new whiskey experience, consider one of Stephanie's other masterful expressions, including Dewar's 15-year, Double Double 21-year, or Dewar's 8-year Mizunara cast finish, and discover just how rewarding curiosity can be. Enjoy responsibly. Whiskey Cast In-Depth is brought to you by Mortlock and the Classic Malts lineup. Isla is known for its distilleries, and the Scottish island is about to get its 12th distillery. Local officials have now granted planning permission for what will be known as Lagan Bay Distillery, just across the road from the island's Glenigadale Airport. It's being backed by Isla Boys Limited, the company owned by native Iliox Donald McKenzie and Mackay Smith. They're also independent bottlers and own the Isla Ales Brewery, which will relocate to the Lagan Bay site when it opens. I caught up with Donald McKenzie during his holiday in France and started our conversation with a fairly obvious question. So why does Isla need a 12th distillery? Um, well, in the same way that I would guess uh, Saint Emilion needs another, uh, what, what would it be, 100th uh, vineyard. Um, no, I'm, I'm joking aside, but I, I think... There's always room um, for another quality, uh, Isla Singamore particularly. I don't think we can explore enough peated whiskey, Mark. I'm sorry. You know, and if you're going to have a peated whiskey, you're going to have an Isla whiskey. And I think that having uh, one more, I mean, it'll only be 12. It's not as if it's going to be 112. I mean, we're not in space aid, Mark. You know, I mean, um, so so I, I think I think I think it can be okay. I think honestly, there's room room for that. And anyway, as we have as we have seen over the last what a year or two, um, the distilleries now are expanding. We've seen uh, Colhomon doubling its uh, still house capacity. We've seen Ardbeg bringing in new stills. Um, we've seen major expansion at Bonnehaven. Uh, so you know, clearly the, the big guys are expanding already, uh, which would tend to suggest to you and me and everybody else who's listening to us that there's room for uh, more Isla Single Malt, quite frankly. What does it mean to you to have a distillery, though, being native Isla? Well, it's uh, you know, I mean, I know you'll have heard this a thousand times on 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 on, on your uh, on your uh, on your show, Mark. But you know, the words "dream come true" are probably a little bit hackneyed and a little bit over overblown. Uh, but but really, there's a sense of yeah, a sense of uh, I don't want to say pride because pride comes before a fall. But there's a sense of uh, yeah, a sense of uh, pleasure. I think I think what it means to me is that when I'm uh, dead and buried up in Kilhoman Cemetery beside my parents, um, there'll be something, there'll be a, again, legacy. It's, a, it's a, maybe a bit of a hackneyed word, and I'm sure you'll uh, forgive me for it. Um, but something behind that uh, continues to age uh, in wood, continues to surprise and delight, 
and that continues more prosaically, perhaps, um, uh, solid long-term employment and exciting and interesting and varied careers for uh, young people from Ireland, which was a chance that, you know, to be honest, my generation, we, we didn't really have um, back in the day. What was it like growing up on Isla back in the day? Oh, well, I mean, this is a long time ago, Mark. I mean, I think we just barely invented the wheel. Um, it was, it was, I guess, you know, it, it didn't occur to me. I remember somebody once said to me, you know, wow, that must have been really difficult growing up on an island. And I, I thought, well, I haven't really ever thought about it, actually. Um, but for some people, it is apparently living on a, on a, on a, on a, on a smallish island, although, as you know, Isla is not that small. It never occurred to me. It was very, it was very, very, uh, oh, it was very, very easy growing up on Isla. Everybody knows each other. Um, as as a parent now, uh, I can feel what my parents felt then, which was that we were uh, intrinsically secure as children, because there was always a neighbour who who who'd, who'd be looking out for you. Um, and you know, you could do lots of things as a as a, as a small boy in Isla, um, and undoubtedly a small girl too. Although obviously, my me for me it was being a small boy, but you know, you could you could muck about in boats. My father loved the sea, so from a very early age, I, I kicked about in boats, either sailboats or or, or fishing boats I used to fish and uh, this might bring a smile to your face but I used to, I used to fish for roster um, and crab uh, for the family uh, off Port Charlotte where we moved when I was 11 years old uh, on a daily basis I would go with lobster creels uh, lobster traps and I would bait them with mackerel and, and go out every day I must have been probably about you know 12 13 14 at that sort of age uh, so yeah growing up Isla was was definitely I, 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 I loved it of course as a small boy it didn't occur to me that this this wasn't usual. I thought I thought everybody had this, you know, growing up. But of course, that's not the case, unfortunately. No, it was great. But then you and Mackie uh, set up the brewery a few years ago, acquired the brewery, and got into the beer making business. What prompted you to say, okay, let's move into whiskey after this? Well, actually, it's the other way around. We were independent bottlers from uh, 2016, and we bought the brewery in 2018. And that was because our global headquarters, I mean, sorry, you might laugh, it was a broom cupboard, uh, was in Isla House Square, which is in Bridge End, Isla. Uh, and just opposite uh, our offices was uh, was the brewery. And of course, I, we knew who they were anyway, because on Isla, I mean, there's what, 3,000 of us, so everybody knows everybody else. Um, and to think otherwise is, is mistaken. I remember as a small boy, um, small boy, adolescent boy, uh, going out to what we call a Cayley, which is a traditional uh, Scottish dance thing, you know. And as a young guy, you're out to dance and you know, you're talking to girls or whatever. Uh, and my mum coming in the morning uh, with a glass of orange juice to say, Oh, I heard you took Mary home last night. And I was like, Wait a minute, I, you know, I've been asleep. How do you know this? But of course, that was the jungle telegraph. On Isla, everybody knows what you're doing. But to get back to your question, we were independent bottlers. And of course, we knew the brewery, the beauty guys. And, and, and just frankly, they said to us at one point, listen, guys, um, uh, you know, we we're getting getting on a bit, uh, getting a bit tired. Brewing, as you'll know, particularly craft brewing is essentially about lugging great quantities of uh, of grist and liquid about the place. So it's a physical job. And they said, would you, would that be of an interest? And we had already spoken, me and, and, and Mackay, my partner, about how we felt the brewery was a bit, well, I was going to say sleeping giant, but let's, let's you know, let's temper that a little bit. We felt it had potential perhaps beyond what uh, the previous team had managed to do, and they did a really good job. And so we thought, well, do you know what? Yeah, why, why not? Um, of course, uh, just before a global shutdown with COVID, Mark, I, I really wouldn't recommend getting into brewing, you know, just the, the, just the year before that. But but hey, um, we've come through that. Um, and behind that, of course, and this will come as no surprise to people who are listening to it, um, of course we wanted to get into brewing. And why brewing? Because the key to good whiskey is not what perhaps a lot of people who are less well-informed than people listening to this podcast would think, which is it's distilling and ageing in wood casks, which of course it is. But the key part, of course, is esterification. And when does that happen? It happens in the brewing process. So you can see that it wasn't a completely anodyne thought that we had. We thought, well, if we can master the brewing process, we're well on the way to becoming distillers. Because after you've got your well, any any brewer will tell you that um, the secret to a good a good uh, a good a good uh, single malt is in the brewing. Uh, uh, and uh, and I think that's actually that's actually it's 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 a little bit cheeky, but it's actually true. I mean, everybody in this podcast from my level talked about Jim McEwen, um, and we all have our stories to tell, don't we? Um, but Jim told me, you know, Don, anybody can uh, 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 take a really good wash and bugger it up in distillation. 
But you can't take a, a, a really bad wash and make a good whiskey out of that. You can't do the opposite. Um, and so even years ago, and I was lucky enough to, 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 to learn how to distill uh, uh, under Jim's uh, guiding hand, like a, like a lot of us, and 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 even then he was key clear that that one of the key uh, uh, processes was the brewing process, it was making sure your wash was absolutely spot on, because otherwise you're just chasing after uh, flavour, and you're never going to catch up to it. Um, so that was why uh, that was a main reason for the for the brewery. So there you are. It was to get into independent bottlers, and uh, you, you know a, a lot of the frustration that you can have as an independent bottler, is you're not actually producing stuff. Um, and of course, when you're, when you're brewing, you're producing your own, well, beer, not wash, but, but you can follow a process. I mean, clearly what we thought was, well, let's just stick a, a, a couple of stills on the end of this brew kit and, and away we go. Um, so that was, the, that was the plan even then. Now that you've got the planning permission, what happens now? What happens now is we now have to ask for what we call a building warrant. Um, which is essentially we put into practice the plan of permission that has been uh, achieved, which took uh, almost two years, um, which is fair enough. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of hoops to, to, to jump through, which is entirely normal. It's industrial processes. It's entirely normal that it takes a lot of time with lots of different studies on the ground, on the, the, the flora and fauna, etc. So that, that's, that's a normal thing. I'm not complaining about that. Um, but the next step is a building warrant, which takes uh, several weeks uh, at least uh, to come through. And what we'll do is we'll stage it. So we won't ask for a building warrant for the whole uh, uh, agreed planning permission. We'll ask for a staged building warrant so we can move the, the process of uh, construction along the line. And the first process, of course, is uh, clearing the site. Um, it's got essentially scrub vegetation on it. I don't know if you know the site, Mark. You probably wouldn't have noticed it on the island, but it's opposite the airport on yeah. X uh, Second World War uh, uh, site that used to have Nissen huts on it for essentially um, RAF personnel during the Second World War. So it's a site that's never never really been used for, what, the best part of 80 years. Um, so scrape it off. And if you see it from Google Earth, you can actually see there's uh, foundations underneath it or shadows of foundations. So scrape that off, get it fenced off to keep the sheep off it, um, get secure access from the road we're off, we come in off the main A846 A- 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 road uh, that goes past Isla Airport from Port Ellen to Bamore that you'll know very well. Um, so we have to get secure access into it. So that sort of thing. Get access, get it scraped, get the, the, the mapping out for the, the, the foundations for the different buildings, uh, production uh, buildings, cent- uh, visitor centre, etc., and then start getting that done. The good thing is, of course, that Isla not having uh, winters that are too difficult um, means that we can probably even do things like concrete foundations over the winter. Uh, you'll probably be aware that you wouldn't want to be putting down concrete and anything in anything approaching negative temperatures. Um, but of course, on Isla, we're lucky. We have the, the Gulf Stream that uh, brings us our warm, uh, balmy winters. Uh, well, maybe not so warm and balmy, but but, <laughs> but not, not, not freezing anyway, not freezing anyway. So that's, the, that's the next step. Uh, Compared to the Cairngorms, it's balmy. Exactly. Compared to Cairn, well, compared to Moscow, with which we shame the lati- same latitude, as, you, as you're fully aware, it's definitely bad. Um, and that's thanks to the, 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 the Gulf Stream, uh, as we're both well aware. So that's the next steps. And then just phase, phase, you know, phase things through. Of course, while you're doing that, you're also doing uh, equipment specification. Well, re- revisiting the equipment specification, uh, redoing all the quotes, uh, getting things moving on that front as well. These things take time. Uh, so there's a lot to be done, a lot to be done, you know, which is why I'm happy to be on vacation, leaving my buddy Mackay to do all that stuff. <laughs> Now, how is this partnership with Ian McLeod going to work? Well, uh, you know, the the of course, you know, like a lot of us, we're, we're passionate people, um, and and passion's great, and 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 so is uh, positive energy. It's great, and and I've got lots of both of them. But at some point, you also have to uh, uh, realize that you need to have the appropriate skill sets if you want to hit the ground running. And, and frankly, for us, we've known uh, uh, Leonard Russell, the chairman of Ian McLeod, and a great deal of his team for a very long time. Uh, we've worked with them already uh, for a long time. We really appreciated the fact that they were family owned, uh, family managed. Uh, Leonard essentially, uh, uh, as, as MD, uh, takes all the big decisions with, of course, the, the, the Ian McLeod board uh, backing him up or not on that. Um, and there, kind of family values and old fashioned kind of Scottishness that they share perhaps with ourselves really, I don't know, it means a lot to us actually. It genuinely does. 
Um, and so that was really, for us, was one of the main reasons we, we were really keen uh, to have Ian McLeod uh, come, to come and, and help us to realise this. Because they have, as you know, Glenn Goyne, Tam Dew and Rose Banks coming down the line, which already is a, is a fascinating uh, thing to think about, that Rose Bank will one day uh, live again. But Glenn Goyne for many, many years, and, and I, I would presume you're the same, Mark, but for, for Glenn Goyne, even before I knew uh, Leonard, I mean, Glenn Goyne to me was always, and I still say that to, 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 to people who are out with the industry, Glenn Goyne to me is, is almost like a benchmark uh, Scotch single malt. Okay, it's the slowest distilled, but it's the slowest distilled. For me, it's one of the purest, sweetest, gentlest, uh, highest quality single malt. I often say to people, look, buy a Glen Goyne 12, a Glen Goyne 15. You cannot go wrong. If you don't know your scotch, buy, one, buy a Glen Goyne, and honestly, you, will, you, will, you can't put a step wrong in that. And I've always said that genuinely, even before uh, uh, getting to know uh, Leonard. And frankly, those skill sets uh, brought to bear on an Isla distillery, for us, uh, it's, it's fantastic, Mark. It's fantastic. Now, you know, of course you think you can do everything yourself, but you can't. And you cannot, I cannot have 200 years of, of, uh, of skill sets learned in, 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 in six months. We're bringing in my clouds. You know, combined, how many years of skill sets does Ian McLeod, the Cloud management and production team have? I mean, it's, it's, it's hundreds of years. And that to us is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Now, I can't let you go since you mentioned uh, working under Jim McEwen. I got to get the best <laughs> Jim McEwen story. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Jim's, a, Jim's a, a great man and I'm a, 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 a very fond of him. And I would say, I genuinely mean this, that there should be a statue uh, built uh, to Jim McEwen, uh, Mark Grenier and Simon Coughlin in Bruchlady. Because let's not forget that Bruchlady for many years, and you'll remember this too, Mark, uh, lay shut and shuttered and unloved. And they brought back uh, energy and passion and vision I know these are a bit hackneyed terms, but they did, though, to that uh, moribund distillery and breathed life back into it, which I think for us, you know, that we take inspiration from that too much, genuinely. You know, that, that to me is a, is a humbling thing, what they've done. Over 100 full-time jobs, quality jobs, Mark, with careers behind them. You know, uh, Adam Hannett, the, who's now, you know, the master distiller with uh, Brook he started off as a, as a tour guide. And so if you've got skill sets that are latent within you, you know, these, these companies and these people are able to, to, to nurture them and bring them forward and, 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 and let you go where, you, where you're able to go, which we think is absolutely inspirational. Um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm very fond of Jim. I, I think there's a, there's a couple of stories spring to mind. Jim's a, 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 great, a great showman. And I, I, and I think he's genuinely very, very good uh, um, with people, he's generous with people. Is what he is. He's very, very generous with his time. He never, he doesn't care whether you are Mark Gillespie or whether you're just an ordinary punter on the street. He will spend as much time with with one or with the other, which I think is probably the best uh, 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 homage I could, I could pay to him. I, I, I remember a story, however, that Mark Rainey tells. I, let's tell a story about Mark just for the fun, because uh, I've got nothing but good things to say about Jim. And your friend, your friends on this as well, just held, heard them all before. But I'll tell a story about Mark that he tells as well, which I think is quite funny. It involves a swear word that I'll try not to use on your airwaves, uh, Mark. But I remember, it's okay, go um, ahead. You sure? It begins with F. It begins with F and ends with a CK. But anyway, uh, uh, this is Mark Rainey telling me this story. And he came up to see Brewer Laddie. Um, which was defunct and shuttered. And it actually had a sign, you remember the story, it had a sign on it at the time, on those gates that we all know now, those, those blue gates with factory closed on the gate. Um, and Mark was saying, ah, oh, damn it, and I wanted to go and have a look at it because it was this mythical distillery that was shut, you know. And he says, I was standing at the gates and I could see at last one person, this is just one poor guy who was there as a kind of mothball guy, walked across the Brookhaddy courtyard that we both know behind the gates and Mark shouts out to him hello 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 sorry to bother you but do you know I love Brooke Hardy single malt and it's such a shame that the, the distillery is closed and I'd really like to visit it I'm so passionate about it you know I would like to breathe life back into this distillery do you think I could possibly have a personalized just even a short tour you know just open the gates and have a wee look and the guy looked at him and said no fuck off <laughs> 
<laughs> which I think is a, is a classic story. Luckily, Mark did not F off and uh, persisted uh, with him and Simon and Jim and actually made it made it what it is today. Uh, but I think it's a great story nonetheless. <laughs> it's a bit shocking, uh, a bit brutal, but it's a great story nonetheless. So oh, it's a great it. story. It's, uh, I've heard it a number of times. Yeah, you must but have heard it. I'm sorry. No. Never, never get, get tired, tired of hearing it. No, never no, get tired no. of it. No, exactly, exactly. I'm sure you could tell me stories back uh, about Jim and Mark as well, Mark. And we could sit here for hours uh, uh, having la- having a big laugh ourselves. Uh, but there you go. It's a great story. I love it. I have to ask because there's been a lot of concern among some of the residents of Isla in recent years that uh, distilleries are getting overbuilt and the impact on the island. And you'll have heard of this, obviously, being on the island. How do you balance the resources that are available with the desire to increase the whiskey capacity? It's a, it's a legitimate concern. And I think all the more so because generally, as you're fully aware, the island distilleries are on the coastline uh, for historical reasons, of course, uh, for, for transport in and transport out, which means that, you know, you, you could say, well, at some point, we, you know, where do we, where do we stop? Uh, our choice uh, was deliberately to choose a site that was in what you could plausibly call a semi-industrial area of Isla, um, with uh, the local seafood factory just behind us. Mark, you might remember that. The local main car dealership is just be- just behind us. There's a couple of building merchants that are there. It's in between, I mean, midway, really, essentially, between Bomor and Portel and right across the peat banks of Isla. There's not really too much inhabitation. There's one house that's on our site um, with a, a, a lovely, a lovely neighbour that we're, we got on with very well, of course. And, and we're actually quite proud to say that we had absolutely no objections during our planning process uh, at all, which our architect says is exceptional, exceptional. Because in any planning process, be it on Isla or elsewhere, you know, uh, someone's going to maybe say, "Well, wait a minute, you know, I don't want lorries or noise." And we can understand that. We had no objections at all. But that's because. I think, in, to many, to, 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 for a greater or lesser extent, we are Isla Boys. Um, our, our company name is the Isla Boys Limited, as you know, and we're very sensitive to local concerns. If we chose that site, Mark, it was deliberately because it was out of the way. It's also because it's a site that was needing uh, uh, used because it's been laying, laying fallow, unused, unloved for 80 years. Well, we're breathing life. It's not agricultural land. It's been it's been cleared already by the Minister of, Minister of Defence 80 years ago. Um, so we're, we're think, we think we're doing something positive for that. Uh, but beyond that, uh, uh, um, we're also looking to engage with the community. I know these are hackneyed terms, but this is true, though. We, nothing would delight us more than to have uh, apprentices coming in from Isla High School, people who say, well, I, don't, I know nothing about brewing or distilling or even the selling or the marketing of whiskey. Well, you know, we would think, we like to think anyway, that we could, we could, we could help uh, uh, deliver uh, skill sets to, to, to local people. Essentially, I suppose what we wanted to do was increase the reservoir of quality year-round skilled work where you or I or anybody else would find pleasure, long-term pleasure in what we do. And to leave a lasting economic gain for the island uh, through a distillery. Now, you could say, yes, but Ireland is diversity in terms of economic uh, 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 support, in terms of economic output. But ultimately, what's Isla famous for? You know, if you're going to go to Bordeaux and be on the Rive Droite or the Rive Gauche, you know, you're going to make wine. You know, um, Isla makes peated whiskey and it makes the best peated whiskey in the world. Well, we are going to make another really good. Will it be the best? It'll be one of the best. Um, but we are sensitive to local concerns, and of course, well, of course, well, I, I shop in the local co-op in Bamoa, uh, and if uh, you know, I have to look at my friends and neighbours in the eyes, Mark, you know. So, of course, we tread lightly on Isla's uh, concerns. Of course, we do. We'd always be sensitive to that. At what point do you guys have to make the Isla Festival two weeks long to give every distillery its own day? <laughs> do you know, do you know, this was a conversation uh, we had on the Fish Isla Committee. Um, and it actually was a conversation that the committee had a few weeks ago, Mark. You'll probably not be surprised to learn that. Um, no, I, I think we all agree that two weeks is probably too much to ask. I mean, you know, you, we can't expect people to take two weeks vacation just for the facial. There'd be too many divorces behind that. Uh, so what we think is perhaps what we ought to do is try and double up or, 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 or you know, make things more interesting over a day. Uh, so rather than have day-long events, perhaps have overlapping events uh, on the same day. I think that's... The general consensus seems to try to go for that rather than having a two-week-long 
a whiskey festival. I mean, I think that's maybe stretching things to breaking point, uh, to be honest. What do you think it's going to be like when that first uh, run comes off the still? Uh, I suspect it would be uh, uh, a very emotional uh, a day. Uh, frankly, a bit like uh, when one has a has a child, not as emotional as that, of course. Let's not compare things that aren't comparable. But I think there will be a similar similar level of emotion, yeah. Because essentially, it's a newborn, isn't it? A newborn. We always think of new of, as new spirit, new mate coming off a still as a as a newly born uh, infant, don't we? And then we like to see it grow up uh, and mature, you know, uh, uh, as 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 it sits in the warehouse and and and, and gathers uh, years in, in in a wooden cask, and you can taste it as it grows. And when it's ready to 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 to, to be served, then that's when you bottle it. So there's, there are parallels certainly with uh, with uh, birth and and growth of, of of our children. I think so. I think any warehouse man would say the same thing. You know. Thanks to Donald McKenzie for spending some time with us on this week's Whiskey Cast in depth. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by our friends at Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with the latest release from the Balveni, the new 16-year-old French oak finish that I mentioned in the news last time around. I received a sample this week. It's bottled at 47.5% ABV, the nose has a hint of grapefruit, along with dried flowers, honey, vanilla, and nice maltiness. The grapefruit note is consistent throughout this whiskey. It's there on the palate, too. It's mouth-coating and sticky with tree fruits, vanilla, honey, and barley sugar as well. The finish is long and fruity with a hint of dried flowers, and, you guessed it, that touch of grapefruit. I'm scoring the Balveni 16-year-old French oak finish... A 94. Last week, Bill Ashburn of Forty Creek suggested that I should taste the Bareface Matsutake whiskey infused with Matsutake mushrooms, and I was able to do just that this week. It's part of the Bareface Wilderness series and bottled at 42.5% ABV. The nose is earthy with touches of garden soil and toasted oak, along with subtle spices and pine rosin. The taste is thick and rosinous with a good earthy character and hints of lemon zest, white pepper, cardamom, toasted oak, and honey. The finish is nice and long with lingering spices and touches of pine and lemon oil. I'm scoring the Bareface Matsutake Canadian Whiskey a 92. Finally, I spent some time tasting the initial releases from New Zealand's Waiheke Whiskey with distiller Mark Izzard on Friday. Let's look at the Waiheke Bog Monster, their heavily peated whiskey made with New Zealand malt. The local peat is not as phenolic and musty as Scottish peat, and that shows in this whiskey. It's bottled at 46% ABV. The nose has notes of wood smoke, pine rosin, lemon zest, and touches of camphor and bacon. The taste is full of caramel candy with a hint of brine along with bacon, barley sugar, and a gentle smokiness. The finish is long and smoky with a hint of bacon. I like bacon, and I like this whiskey. I'm scoring the Waiheke Bog Monster a 92. I'll be adding these whiskeys to our searchable list of more than 3,300 whiskeys from all over the world. You can search by a whiskey's name, country, style, or even the score I gave it. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey, a 100-time award-winning Maryland-style rye. With a determined focus to create the best rye whiskey imaginable, their team of distillers crafts each spirit with a nod to both tradition and innovation. Find their signature Double Oak, Cask Strength, or Reserve Series rye whiskeys, as well as their line of premium rye whiskey canned cocktails at a retailer near you. Just visit sagamorespirit.com slash find dash rye. Please drink responsibly. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Kentucky and Ireland have plenty in common. Two homes of horse racing. Mm-hmm. 
bluegrass music is said to have Irish roots. Um, okay, it's not the longest list, but the Redbreast Kentucky Oak edition only strengthens the bond. Finished in sustainably sourced Kentucky Oak for a captivating nose and round taste. I see a triple crown in this thoroughbred's future. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice, presented by Scarabus Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Bobby Tanzillo of Milwaukee sent this tweet the other day, listening to a story about replacing green plastic bottles with clear ones to help with recycling, and it got me thinking. I like the look of whiskey boxes and tubes, but is that a justification for the added packaging? Is there an upside I'm missing that justifies the cost and waste? And he asked if we've done anything on this. We have, in the past, as some whiskey companies decide to get rid of their so-called excess packaging to minimize waste. I just talked with the folks at New Zealand's Waiheke Whiskey the other day, as I mentioned during our tasting notes segment. They plan to release their first whiskies soon in bottles made entirely of recycled glass, along with a screw cap made from recycled plastic to make it easier to reuse the bottles. Those bottles will come in an optional box, but that one is made of completely compostable material. We do have one more follow-up comment on the proposed U.S. government recognition of American single malt whiskies. At Shochu Danji of the Japan Distilled Podcast posted this on our Instagram page. Great! Now can they recognize the WTO-protected Ryuku Awamori and its 600-year history as a spirits category, along with its younger cousin Hankaku Shochu with its 500-plus year history? We discussed this absurdity on the most recent episode of Japan Distilled. Well, it's probably that the TTB has never been asked to recognize either one. Usually, that sort of thing follows free trade agreements, in which each country agrees to give official recognition to the other country's spirits. But here's the thing. Anyone anywhere can petition the TTB to create a standard of identity for a spirit, just like the folks at the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission did. All you have to do is put it in writing and send it to the TTB administrator in Washington. If there's anything you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on social media. Look for Whiskey Cast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Scarabus, the Isla single malt from Hunter Lang & Company that celebrates all of Isla's natural gifts in one bottle. Only those who seek shall find Scarabus, Start your search at HunterLang.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Last time around, we mentioned the issue of added colorings and flavorings to American whiskeys as part of the debate over the proposed standards for American single malt whiskeys. It's worth explaining just what is allowed under U.S. federal regulations— the key here is that if a whiskey is either a bourbon or labeled as straight, nothing else can be added to it, period. Other types of whiskies can have so-called harmless coloring, flavoring, or blending materials added to them, as long as it doesn't exceed 2.5% of the overall volume of that bottle. Basically, that amounts to 18.75 milliliters in a standard 750 ml bottle. They don't have to be disclosed on the label, as long as the amount stays below that threshold. The exception, and there's always an exception, flavored whiskies. Those can have flavorings in excess of 2.5%, but the flavorings have to be disclosed on the label. For instance, the new Arcane Alpha whiskey from Arcane Distilling in Brooklyn, New York, is distilled from fully hopped beer, so the label lists it as, quote, American whiskey with hops. Now, what kind of things are we talking about in terms of these flavorings? Well, the TTB's Beverage Alcohol Manual lists specific colorings and additives that can be used, including caramel, along with flavorings ranging from essential oils and spices to fruit juices and commercially produced flavorings and infusions. 
Wine and sugar can be added where specifically allowed or essential. For instance, a whiskey liqueur has to have flavorings added to it. And if there's a long-standing practice calling for added flavorings or colorings, that's also okay. Such as the specifically stated practice of adding small amounts of blending sherry and caramel to blended American whiskeys to add consistency in color and flavor. Now, if you don't want to have to wonder whether any of this stuff is in an American whiskey, just stick to bourbon or any straight whiskey. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, And, of course, a complete archive of past episodes going all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Well, folks, we're nearing the end of another great episode of WhiskeyCast, which means you're probably craving some whiskey. Head on over to Dewars.com or your local retailer to discover what makes Dewars the most awarded blended scotch whiskey in the world. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. So, in Spain, they call Redbreast Petty Rocco. It's me, but a touch more exotic. Kind of like a Redbreast PX edition. Finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, adding a velvety and decadent dimension. You know... I won't lie. A climate like this makes me wish I was a migratory bird. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2022, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.